Well, let me encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word as we begin the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, that's probably no surprise to you, and starting uh, there and reading to verse 8. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord out of Colossians 1, 1 to 8 for this morning. May the Lord write its eternal truths on our hearts. You may be seated. The few and the faithful, am I right? You know this doesn't happen for something like another 11 years. We won't have a Sunday on New Year's for another 11 years, I think. (laughs) Someone's going to check it. I think maybe it's 10 years. Anyway, it's a long time from now. And so let me just start by saying Happy New Year. You guys awake today? Yes. The ones that actually went to bed before. You watched the 9 o'clock dropping of the ball, so then you could hit the sheets. Am I right? Come on. And y'all slept well. And look at this. It's like I can like lay out. Don't lay out. Don't lay out. But you could lay out if you wanted to lay out. And uh, I, I just, I feel bad about one thing. And it's that uh, Pastor Chris has apparently been on a, a, a spree here of eight in a row of preaching this service. And I stole it from him. I wanted Jan 1. And so you're just going to have to feel for Chris. If some of you came today, you're like, I knew Pastor Chris was preaching today. That's why I showed up. I am so sorry. You get me. But in a few weeks, you'll probably get Chris again. So just give him a big pat on the back and say, when you come up Jan 1, I'm going to be celebrating for you, man. But I had to do it today. It's just not often we get the Lord's Day on New Year's Day, starting a new book of the Bible. We excited? Come on. The Lord's going to meet us in this book. It's the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Colossians. And as you do that, hello, if you're new here, my name's Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa Church. And we're delighted to have you and would love to welcome you into our body. Um, I usually hang out in the lobby after the service. It'll be really easy to see me today because you won't have to be like fighting through crowds to get there. And uh, so come say hi. We'd love to connect with you and see if we can't help you get plugged into the church Uh, We're pretty passionate about preaching books of the Bible, aren't we, church? Verse by verse, teaching the whole counsel of God's word, because that's how we grow as believers. We're firmly committed to that. And so you're starting on a perfect day where you can carry all the way through the series with us, and we're delighted for that to be the case. Let me give you a little bit of a background on the book of Colossians as we kind of enter in today. The book of Colossians, no surprise, we get it in the first verse, is written by the apostle Paul. Most likely, while Paul was in prison in Rome, and you think about your timeline, biblically speaking, we're talking about somewhere in the Acts 27, Acts 28 region of history, okay? Something in 62 or 63 AD, he's writing this letter. Now, the background to this letter to the church at Colossae is that the church at Colossae was led by this guy named Epaphras. And I love his story. In many ways, I feel like I'm inspired by his story and can kind of relate to his story. Epaphras was evidently hearing Paul preach the gospel in Ephesus, and he got saved. 
and he was so radically transformed by the gospel, hearing about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sinners, placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and took that faith that he had back to his hometown, which he probably never wanted to go back to, all right? Because that's how you feel about hometowns. Maybe it's not, I'm embellishing, I don't know. But I didn't want to come back to my hometown. He didn't want to go back. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But he goes back to his hometown, compelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ, begins sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And upon his faithful proclamation of the gospel, the church is planted at Colossae. So this guy is responsible for God's work being used, you know, by God to see many people come to Christ in Colossae to the point that over years as they develop, they were sending people and they helped to establish other churches in the Lycus Valley where they were. Uh, churches in places like Hierapolis, which you've probably not heard of or been that familiar with, but then places like Laodicea as well, which you would be much more familiar with, correct? Because it's that famous passage we know well about the, them ne being, being neither uh, uh, like hot nor cold, they were lukewarm, right? And this whole idea of where the church at Laodicea fell in the book of Revelation in those early letters to the churches. And so, what we have here is Epaphras traveling to Rome to bring the news of all this good stuff that the Lord is doing in Colossae and the Lycus Valley to Paul, and Paul's hearing about what God was doing there, and he writes this letter to the church to encourage them on towards maturity in Jesus Christ. And there's really specific reason why he's doing this, and we're going to pick this up as the book goes on, but he's writing to encourage them in maturity because there were false teachers that were seeking to lead them astray. And what they were going to find is the maturity they needed was a confident belief that the, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is sufficient for what they need to grow as believers. And so we get the first eight verses today, and um, we're titling it, I'm going to give it this title, Gospel Growth for 2023, okay? Gospel Growth for 2023. January 1, as I mentioned in my prayer, was it just has this like goal-setting, aspiration-oriented gonna get after it, right? There's something about Jan 1, it's like, oh, it's a new page. It's a new year. I could be anything. I could do anything. I could dream about what I want to accomplish. And I'm sure many of you even sat down last night or have been thinking this week of what you wanna do and what you wanna be and how 2023 is gonna be different. And here, here's what I would say. Whether you're a seasoned saint or you're new to the Christian faith altogether, growth in your faith should be on 2023's agenda for you, right? That's not rocket science. Growth in your faith should be on your agenda. And that's for everybody. Nobody in the Christian life graduates from needing to grow. Do we understand that? One of the things that's bothered me as a pastor and being with other leaders sometimes is this sense in which somehow, I don't know if it's just this vibe that is given off, but the people that are, you know, leaders in something or just kind of have it all dialed in, it almost feels like they never grow. They've just, they've, they've come to this pinnacle. They've achieved it. They've got all their theology dialed in. They've got how to do it all practically. Their church is perfectly organized all the ways that they want it to be. There is no need to, be, uh, to grow at all. There just is with them. I'm just being. I'm at that pinnacle already. I, I don't understand that at all. If you can't find areas where you need to grow, that's probably saying something about you more than it's saying something about how awesome you are. So no one graduates from Christian growth. Forgive me if it looks like I'm someone who comes off as having it all together. Yes, we should be dialed in on our theology. Yes, there's a lot of things about our theology that shouldn't change. But as the gospel works its way through our lives, we should be growing every year of our lives. I don't care if you're a 50-year veteran in the Christian faith. Don't give that vibe off. And if you're new in the Christian faith, no one grows, nobody 
apart from active participation, active engagement with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's the big idea for today, and I pray it's the foundation for your growth in 2023. God's work in your life is directly connected to the gospel's work in your life. If it's not your engagement in the gospel, you will not be growing. Because God's work is pleased, he, God's pleased to make his wonderful, sanctifying work happen through the application of the gospel to your life. And so we're going to see that the gospel is the main focus. It's the main focus in the first eight verses. It's the main focus throughout. Paul is going to highlight the sufficiency of the gospel, and I'm going to give it to you in four ways, broken down with some application-oriented points so that you can go home and flesh this stuff out, okay? We want to be growing. We're all going to be trying to grow by God's grace, and we're going to grow in the gospel. Yes? Great. Four ways we're going to do that. First thing is this. Stand in gospel grace in 2023. Stand in gospel grace. Paul gives us the intro in verses one and two, and we can kind of tend to sleep on the intro because it's normal. Because if you look at Colossians, or you look at Ephesians, or you look at Philippians, or you look at Galatians, they all run similar, right? Paul gives an intro, he explains who he is, he says grace and peace, blah, 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 get to the good stuff, let's just start at verse 3, right? But I think what we forget is they're actually oriented differently in different letters that he writes, and that the customary intro is actually just a vehicle for Paul to just pack full of a theology of gospel grace, okay? Um, <laughs> I'll put it like this. You guys probably did a lot of cooking over the last week, right? I happened to, lived in Mexico City for a year, was trained by a, a Mexican mama on how to make guacamole, and I make a killer guacamole, okay? Now, a chip matters, right? Because if it's flimsy and it can't carry my guacamole, we got a problem, correct? But if you get a chip that's substantive, that can hold up to the guacamole, I don't really care about the chip. The chip's not the focus. The chip is the vehicle to get the guacamole to my mouth. Does that make sense? So I don't care what kind of chip it is. As long as it can hold up, give me whatever chip. Go to the store, get the chip. Because I, I got to get something to get it in here. Look at the glory that's on top of this, okay? This in me, happy. That's how that works. Paul's doing the same thing in his intro. Don't be thrown off by the customary intro. This is a means for all this goodness to get into us about the gospel. And yet, we begin with who is writing the letter? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He's an apostle. He's one of the ones sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he starts here establishing his credentials, guys, uh, because he did on a regular basis, but even more specifically to Colossae because Paul didn't know the congregation personally. He hadn't met him before. He knew him through what Epaphras was sharing about the ministry that was taking place. And so he shares his apostolic status as one who is saying, listen, I am the apostle to the Gentiles who has sent people, believable, credible witnesses, to do ministry of which one is Epaphras. And our connection is that you know Epaphras. But he is sent by me who is responsible, sent by the Lord Jesus Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul comes and establishes the, the authority by which he teaches and the authority by which he can come and care for this church so he can just walk into the doors and you're like, why does this guy care about me so much? Well, it's because of this role that he was given. And he's given it versus um, created it himself. He didn't make it happen. He wasn't like pining to see if he could, you know, get elected for this role. No, he, he tells you how he got it. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Like he rightly sees his life the way we all should. Wherever and however your life is shaking out, it's shaking out by the will of God. You are what you are by the will of God. Paul was knocked off a horse 
on the road to Damascus and blinded by the glory of Christ revealing in a wonderful way himself, Paul's like, man, I am here not by man's initiation, but by God's divine orchestration. This is my established place by the will of God. And he comes on behalf of Timothy, their brother, meaning he's not alone in his imprisonment even as he writes to them. But then he gets to this amazing gospel grace that we ought to think through and stand in in 2023. And he introduces them like this. He speaks to them as this. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ and at Colossae. What a privileged way of being spoken about. You are the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Sacramento, at Rockland. A title that you didn't earn, but is gifted to you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. A title that was, um, you know, has got some Old Testament echoes, right, to the saints. You know what that means? It means holy ones. That's how he's describing you, church. That's how he's describing the church at Colossae to the holy ones. You're like, I don't, I ain't, I ain't a holy one. You are in Christ. You have been made holy in Christ. There is a positional, definitive sanctification whereby in Christ you have been made holy such that you can be called the saints. Pick it up on that language in Exodus 19. Do you remember that language, Israel? Having been saved through the Exodus by the grace of God, God establishes this covenant with them, whereby in drawing them to himself, he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You are a people set apart for me. You have an identity and you are mine. What he's telling the church filled with Gentiles in Colossae, this place that didn't have the gospel before Epaphras came, he's going, you are a part of this privileged people. You are the people of God. And you are the people of God through the new covenant that was initiated and established by the shedding of Jesus' blood such that the ultimate fulfillment of the people of God might spread not just to the people of Israel ethnically, but spread to the ends of the earth, you are, because of your faith in Christ, the chosen and set apart ones for his holy purposes. You are the saints. Do you stand in that grace? But here's another thing about it. The word saints is only ever used in the plural in the Bible. Now, you could uh, come back at me and be like, wait a minute, Philippians 4.21 says saint, but if you read it in context, it says every saint, speaking to the whole church. It's always speaking about the church at large. So here's part of your identity, not just that you're the holy one individual with your kind of ISO Lone Ranger Christianity, but that you are the saints together as a body of people. God has done something in Christ to bring together one people and we express that saintness together. And a part of our goal in 2023 is to grow, not just in our individual spiritual disciplines, but actually to grow in our participation in the body of a local church to really fulfill the expression of we are saints together, we are set apart to serve one another, means that we are taking another step forward in our discipleship here in the local church. We talk about three W's at Doxa, that a disciple is someone who worships Christ, walks with Christ, and works for Christ. You're going to see that language strewn throughout the book of Colossians. It is everywhere. And we are set apart to serve one another as the saints. But it's this idea of family, which is no surprise because he says you're the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. You're the faithful brothers. We're to see one another as a family. That's how God wants us to be. In the local church, one of many expressions of what God has done in Christ to bring us together to be his people, a holy nation 
and a kingdom of priests. We are to be that people. We are to be a family brought into relationship. Here's the cool thing. Most of the time, someone walks into church and the expression is, um, well, I didn't feel like that was a very warm church. Or I, I didn't feel like family when I went there. I didn't. So the Christian, the way they think is, not based on how you feel because that's irrelevant. It's based on whether or not it's true or not. So you may not feel like this is your family, and yet we are your family. So there's two ways to operate. Wait and see if you can feel it somewhere else or just choose to be it somewhere that's solid and walk in the fact that you are. There's a difference, right? One, to me, leans a tad bit more mature than the other. All right? You can guess which one I think is more mature. But there's an opportunity to lean into that and go, wait, wait, this is true for me, regardless of how I feel about you or if you're different than me or if I feel like you have different interests or, you know, there's, there's already friends here. Like, so what? Welcome to the family. This is one big extended family gathering, and you're welcome here. Saints in Christ, that's who we are. As a family, with God as our Father and one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And then he says this, in Christ at Colossae. So to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He's got this like dual kingdom, kingdom citizenship thing going. This is what's so cool about your life as a believer. You, you're in Christ and you're at Rockland. W wherever you go, spatially on a geographic level, wh which by the way you are, while you're living, going to be in some geographical sphere, and at the same time you're also living in a spiritual sphere. So that wherever you go in this world, like 2022 and 2021 was the year of, they're calling it already the great resettlement, right? California knows that everyone's moving out of California. Half of you are probably still ready to move and all that stuff. But what they're actually saying is people, a lot of people aren't counting the cost on what that actually looks like to move. And so we're going to see the effects of what they're calling the great resettlement settle out this year and the next year as people go, I can't believe I moved somewhere that I thought was going to be great and really moved impulsively and here we are. But that's probably not happened. It's just hypothetical, and we'll see. <laughs> but the point is, it doesn't matter where you are. Wherever you are, you're in Christ. Whatever you do, you're in Christ. Get this. When you sin, you're sinning in Christ. That's weird, isn't it? It's actually incredibly comforting. That when you sin, it's not he goes, you're out. And then you got to come back in. It's both comforting and shocking that all of that stuff is happening. So however you live, whatever you do here on earth, wherever you are, whether it's Rockland or Sacramento or Granite Bay or Folsom or wherever you're going, you are, wherever you're doing, you're doing it in Christ. In a sphere geographically, in the place that God has placed you. And as a result of the standing that is yours, this amazing standing that you can be called holy ones when you're not, you can be called the faithful brothers of the family of God because of what Christ has done. He says, make grace to you and peace from God our Father. He's just pouring out this grace to you and he's hoping that the grace will come out in the form of this letter. He starts with grace to you. He finishes the last verse of the whole book of Colossians is grace be with you. Grace to you, may God's grace overflow to you. It's yours in Jesus Christ, but may it specifically overflow to you in the means of grace that this letter provides. Specifically, may this letter meet you as God's grace in your life. You go, where's God's grace showing up? It's showing up for the next four or five months in the book of Colossians to you every week as we gather together. That's where God's grace is gonna be. You're like, I'm looking for it, I'm looking for it. It's in the book. It's in the book. And then when you're done reading the letter, he says, now, Bible shut, scriptures closed, go and live it out. He goes, now grace be with you. And peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of this tangible wholeness and peace of mind and heart that stems from the nature of their right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That Jesus, having satisfied the wrath of God, deserving their sins on the cross, 
In the same way he's satisfied the wrath of God deserving your sins on the cross, if indeed you have come to a place, your faith in Jesus Christ, you can have this peace with God that surpasses all understanding. That's available to the believer. That's available to the one who knows Christ as Lord and Savior. You say, how do you enter into such a relationship? Colossians 2, 6 and 7 says, you do it by receiving Christ by faith. How do I enter into this relationship where I can have peace with God, where God's grace is overflowing, where he makes me part of the family of God? Do I earn that? No, you receive it as you receive Jesus Christ by faith. Guys, this is all about who we are as our identity. You are saints together. You are faithful brothers together. You are dual kingdom citizenship people. You are citizens here, but whatever you do here, you do it in Christ. And this is who we're to be, this is how we're to see ourselves, and this is how we're to act in 2023. And then it continues. The second sufficient display of the gospel is this. You have to, number two, seep in gospel Gratitude, you have to seep in it. There's a word. Like a tea bag seeps in water, soaking it up. You gotta seep in gospel. Gratitude, he starts in really the whole foundation of the next many verses. It's Paul's Thanksgiving. He goes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what sparks that gratitude? Prayer, when we pray for you, prayer is the seedbed of gospel gratitude. Prayer is this gift given to us in the gospel, whereby when you are saved, you are welcomed into the presence of the throne room of God, not just to come into the presence of the throne room of God, but to come into the presence of the throne room of God with confidence drawing near with confidence because you know you can stand before him as you stand in Christ. And Paul had relished this gospel gift of prayer, which allowed him to slow down enough in life to see the evidences of gospel grace in others, which led him to have a gospel gratitude for that gospel grace he was seeing in other people's lives. We need more of that this year. We are good at doing. We are not good at praying. Okay? Some of you look like, speak for yourself. You are not good at praying. You are good at doing. That is our culture's bent. We're good at getting stuff done. We're not good at seeping in prayer with the Lord. We, we don't slow down enough for that to be the case. And you know, look, at Paul's, look at Paul's language here. He says, we always thank God. Now, he doesn't mean literally every moment, but he means regularly. And he's saying we, which is the language we also don't often apply to prayer. Again, prayer is me and the Lord, me and the Lord, me before dinner. Okay, no, wait, my family's together on that portion. Right? Me before bed, it's me and the Lord. It's me and the Lord. I'm trying to get us into more of a it's we and the Lord. Yes, it's you and the Lord, but it's also we and the Lord. And one of the ways we've tried to do this in the past is through Second Sunday. And starting this year, we're taking this whole need to seep in gospel gratitude to a whole different level. We're taking the concept of Second Sunday and we're delivering that corporate prayer element into the avenue of kind of our biggest arm of discipleship coming out of our church. We're taking the concept of Second Sunday, and we're going to stream it through small groups from here on out. So that once a month, we will be gathering as a people in our small groups to welcome not just the group that comes on a Sunday afternoon, but welcomes the many, many more people that actually make up this church for a time of more extended, slowed down corporate prayer time that then will culminate and we will still gather together as the people of God, but we're going to do it once a quarter for a whole church prayer and worship night together 
where we seek the Lord, where everything is closed down ministry-wise because that is the thing that week. So we do second Sundays, right? I have done them every month of the year. We're going to do eight prayer no, weeks together, uh, eight, one single week out of a month throughout this year in small group together. And then four of those weeks will be corporately gathering together so that we can leverage this seeping in gospel gratitude. So we can leverage this soaking in prayer together and giving thanks together and seeking the Lord together. Because Paul evidently sees it as being a regular rhythm to his life. And we're going to inv invite our whole church to be a part of this. He says, we always thank God the Father. I love that. He's evidently going to go on to say, we thank God because we see these marks of the true Christian life going on in your church. We see it. We see it happening. There are tangible evidences that you really are Christians. And we praise God for that. Now, what's awesome is he doesn't say, you know what? Way to be solid Christians, church in Colossae. Good stuff. You guys are mature. You're really solid. You did it. What does he say here? No, he didn't say you did it. He says God did it. Right? Like, so some of you may be at that stage where um, for Christmas, you've got little kids and they don't have jobs yet. It's not little kids that should have jobs or they don't have jobs because they're like whatever they are now, Gen Z, and they don't work. Or I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about like, you know, seven, eight years old before they can get a job. And, uh, and you know, mom or dad goes, hey, you know, here's some money, guys. Let's go get a gift for mom, all right? Let's put it in that context. And then the kids get a gift for mom, but it's really on your dime. You know how that works? You haven't ever had something like that go down? Okay, sweet. So like when that goes down, what happens usually is the person receiving the gift goes, oh, thanks, buddy, that's so awesome. And then it goes, thank you to the, to the person who's really paying for it. You know what I'm saying? So we can celebrate all day long the grace of God going on in the church, but it's kind of like our participation and our growth is kind of like, oh, great, buddy, encourage that you're, thank you, God. You see what I'm saying? That's kind of how this is. Oh, hey. Thank you, God. Your faith gifted by him. Your love comes from him. Actually, it comes from the spirit, according to verse 8. And all of it's grounded in this hope that comes from him. So if you find yourself hungering for more of Jesus this year, if you come into 2023 and you're like me and I'm, I'm kind of going, man, what do I want to grow in? What do I want to focus on? And you're just like, man, I just want to commune with Christ this year. I want to walk with him more deeply than I have before. If you're fighting for daily joy in Jesus, if you are enduring long-sufferingly in a body to remain a part of a local body instead of jumping ship, all of that stuff is such awesome evidences of God's grace and God deserves the thanks, not you. It's all him. And ingratitude comes when you aren't seeking him and seeing his grace behind the things that his people do. We need to seep in this gospel gratitude. We need to slow down so that the evidences of God's grace in others would be sweetened to us and elevated to us so that we can see them and savor them for what they are as they give us opportunity to praise God for that work. And then, like I said, this gratitude rises out of these marks that Paul is celebrating that seem to be true in the Colossians' life as believers. And Paul says all of that springs from where they set their minds. And so the third evidence, the third application of gospel work that reflects gospel sufficiency and ought to be a foundation for our life in 2023 is to set our minds on gospel glory. You're going to see how this comes together, to set your minds on gospel glory. We're going to stand in gospel grace. We're going to seep in gospel gratitude. We're going to set our minds on gospel glory. And he lays this out. Epaphras has given this update to Paul. It's caused Paul to thank God because he heard of the signs of this true faith. And we've seen this Christian trio before. The words faith, hope, and love do anything for anybody. 
These are the words that Paul uses regularly because of your faith, your hope, and your love. He's changed the order to being faith and love and hope, and there's a reason the order is the way it is, but he's praising God for the work he's seeing in them that their Christian faith, listen, some people go, man, yeah, I'm a Christian, but uh, I make it, I keep it really personal. I keep it to myself. I don't really, there's no real expression that comes out of my life. Paul would not be thanking God if that was the case because a true Christian life is not secret, nor is it silent. You see it. You see evidences of faith. You go, I got a faith. This is James 2, right? Show me, show me your faith. Your faith should come in 3D. If it doesn't come in 3D, there's a concern. For the Colossian church, it came in 3D. They could see it in their life. You see my faith because you see the love that we have for one another. And so he says, man, we thank God when we pray for you since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. It's always faith first, isn't it? Which makes sense because that's the foundation. But it's not just a faith that he celebrates, it's a faith in Christ. In Christ as the object, your faith is in Christ, he is the object of your faith, and your faith is in Christ as in it lives and moves and has its being in Christ. And he says, we've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, your trust in Jesus, your confidence in Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints. See, this is a perfect connection here because true faith always issues in love. A true faith in Jesus Christ will issue forth in love because to know God is to love God and to love God is to obey God and to delight in what he delights in, namely his own. And so I love this because he says, we've heard of your faith and you have this love for all of the saints. That's what's so amazing about gospel grace that I'm seeing. Really hard to give credit to a Christian who picks and chooses a few Christians that they can tolerate to be their friends at church, which is an easy way to operate. That's not what's giving Paul the encouragement that the gospel is flowing through their veins. What's giving Paul the encouragement that the gospel is flowing through their veins is they had a love for all the saints. Not just the hand-picked ones, not just the ones who are like you, not just the ones who are your age, not just the ones who satisfy your need for relational connection, which is about as deep and far often as Christian connection goes. Do you like the church? It depends whether or not you have people that are like you and want to be friends with you. That is not a sign of the gospel. The sign of the gospel is you have a love for all the saints. Why do you love that person? They're nothing like you. They're not even your age. You don't even shop at the same stores together. What do you have to talk about, Jesus? Right, one of the greatest joys of being a pastor is I'm forced to do this. <laughs> Can we just be honest? You guys pick and choose, right? I know that. You even get to pick the church. I don't get to pick you. You get to pick the church, you know? I love you. <laughs> but like, one of the things that could be true of me is it looks like I've got a love for all the saints, but it could be missing from my heart too. So now let's not try to put on a show. Like, look at how many diverse people I love when you know you're really doing it because I'm trying to get some attention. My heart's not really there, but Lord, look at this. These are some weirdos, <laughs> and I love them. We good? Right? It's like coming to, I, I have loved coming to love all the saints. It has been one of the sweet fruits of the Christian growth that I have walked through personally is that love. And Paul says there's a foundation for where all this comes from, for why they're able to love all the saints the way they do, and it's because of the hope of the gospel that's laid up for them. Notice what he says. He says that there's a, there's a, there's a fountain, there's a spring from which this love flows forth, and it's because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. 
So what he's saying is, because, to, to borrow the words of the apostle Peter, because the church had set their hope fully on the grace that will re- be revealed to them or brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 13, because they had confidence that their eternal inheritance is laid up in heaven, imperishable, undefiled, and kept for them, 1 Peter 1, 4, because their future hope had already commenced in their union with Christ such that Paul could say in Colossians 3, 1, you have been raised up with Christ. You're not looking to be resurrected. You have been resurrected. Because that's true of them, meaning resurrection reality is an inaugurated reality for believers even in this moment, which is a confidence for them of the surety that will be consummated in a glorious place of resurrection existence in the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, because they were so stinking heavenly minded, they were unbelievably earthly good. Which of course is the flip of what we normally hear. Christians are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's just fundamentally a fallacy. It's not like I'm counseling people going, oh, you should really stop praying as much as you do. I would love that counseling session, has not happened. Man, if I could just get you to stop reading your Bible and pleading with the Lord, you're where, look at the floorboards. You're gonna have to get new, t- forget this. Slow down, champ, all right? How old are you, 35? You got a lot of years to live. Come on, you can pace yourself with this whole Jesus thing. That's not the conversations I'm having. Because their souls were riveted on things above. They literally refused to be swayed from this keeping their mind on things above, not things that are on earth that are seen. Because they just were captivated by the meditation and memorization of the hope that is revealed in the word of the truth, he says in verse 5. Where is this hope found? In the word of the truth, the gospel, love sprang forth as a result. You go, well, how is this possible? Why is hope the foundation of the spring of love? And it's because of this. When you live from the certainty and reality of your heavenly inheritance, it frees you from the rat race of self-preservation and self-centeredness that so easily dominates our lives. It is that simple. And it can be in well-meaning things. There is a self-preservation and there's a self-centeredness and just needing to keep the machine going. Got to keep making money. Got to keep making deals. Got to keep going on. Got to keep making this. How do we got to keep affording this lifestyle? Got to keep, got to keep, got to keep. They're not necessarily bad things. It's about where you set your hope. You got to pay your bills. You got to take care of your family. You got to do these things, but it's where you set your hope and therefore what occupies your mind. In other words, it's kind of like this. Why work so hard to secure for yourself a corruptible form of what is already yours and will be yours in consummate perfection? Why are we doing it? We spend so much time working way harder to hold on to a corruptible form of something that is already yours and will be yours. When you get that, what you realize you stop doing is you stop making that the focus and you start preparing yourself for the glory that's coming. And how do you prepare yourself for the glory that's coming? How do you get yourself ready for heaven? When your sights are set there, it's like, all I want to do. When you have something big coming up, it's like all you're thinking about is that preparation, right? You're going to a big game. You're like, I'm going to read all the blogs. I'm going to listen to all the, the, the talk show radio guys. And we're going to be so dialed in on this. Like, what are you doing when you're preparing for heaven? He's like, do the works of heaven. That's how you prepare for heaven. So what's heaven going to be like? It's going to be a whole lot of love in heaven. And so you're just spending yourself going, I'm just preparing. This is what it's going to be like in heaven. Where all the things I'm pursuing in corruptible form will be mine in consummate perfection and love will be the center of it and therefore I am after love. And it just starts pouring out. Friends, it is not worldly minded or heavenly mindedness 
that leads to no earthly good. It is definitely worldly mindedness being consumed with self instead of setting your hope on gospel glory. Riveted, not moving from the hope of the gospel as is revealed in the word of the truth. And then he finishes with this, seek gospel growth. The word of truth has come to you and we are to seek gospel growth. It says the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, speaking to the church there, to y'all, it's plural, as indeed in the whole world, it's bearing fruit and Increasing. In other words, hey, listen, the, the gospel that's impacting you is the same gospel that's been impacting other places around the world. Now, when he says the whole world, don't freak out there and be like, oh, the Bible's not true because it, it hasn't gone to the whole world yet. This is Paul speaking in a, honestly, he's speaking in a couple different ways. Number one, he's speaking in a prophetic way that when Jesus said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, go and make disciples, it was actually happening. His authority was winning out and the gospel was moving. And so Paul was watching it go from one, gospel, one Gentile town to the next Gentile town to the next Gentile town. It was starting to permeate all these really strategic locations. And Paul's going, that's the promise. That's what my Savior said. He's the one with all authority in heaven and earth has been given. The gospel's going forth. See, it's happening, all of it. The same gospel that's going forth and bearing fruit and increasing is the same gospel you believe Colossians. Now, what's interesting about the way he says this is that this gospel spread bears these Old Testament echoes. I'm going to show you this. Paul is just filled with Old Testament references. There's an allusion right here in the text which has come to you is indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, Paul is alluding back to the Adamic commission in Genesis 1, 28. You're like, I don't even know what Genesis 1, 28 says. Well, it's good because tomorrow in your Bible and year plan, you will read Genesis 1 and you will find out what Genesis 1, 28 is all about. But we're not going to tucker out this year when you get to Leviticus. We're going to, we're going to, We're going to make it through. This is the year. Some were insulted last year because they're like, I'm one of the ones that made it. I'm like, holla. Praise God. (laughs) So you remember that mandate given to Adam? Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth and fulfill it. Do you remember that? Subdue the earth and rule it. And the idea was with a literal children who would join Adam in reflecting God's image and stewardship as vice regents so that the image bearers of God and his glory would extend over all the earth, right? That was the picture coming out of Genesis 1. Take this garden reality and make it the reality everywhere. In actual, physical children. Do we now remember that? Be fruitful and multiply? So we were like, this is my favorite verse. I love that verse. I just got married. I'm very excited. This is good. Okay. So, Adam botched the commission. Do we know that? Instead of holding fast to God's word, he held fast to the serpent's word and the commission given to Adam failed. Like, well, that's not in the text. Hang on a second. I think the echoes are here. He held to the serpent's word, not the Lord's word, and he failed in the commission given to him. And that failure was pointed to something that was unfinished. It's not been done. There was this kind of gaping hole of what the Lord had asked of his people. They didn't provide, almost just pointing to this need, this desire for this future eschatological humanity who would finally fulfill this command. And what Paul seems to be alluding to here is that now in Jesus Christ, who is the second Adam, because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection, those in Jesus Christ by faith, i.e. the church at Colossians, or i.e. us, are in fact, 2 Corinthians 5.17, new creations, and as part of this new creation, have been established with this commission from the second Adam to enable and fulfill this task that Adam began as his progeny of the last Adam, with God's word, till the glory of God's gospel multiplies with new creations and they fill the entire earth. 
So that in some sense, I'm glad minds are being blown right now. Adam, Paul is saying that in the gospel spreading, you have a new creation fulfillment of this in the second Adam as he is enabling his people to take the gospel of truth and share the glory of God in the gospel and see it multiply around the face of the earth. That the intention of the Adamic covenant is being fulfilled in and through his gospel people today in the new covenant. You even note the garden imagery here. Notice that it's talking in a very Edenic kind of way. There is bearing fruit and there is increasing. They were the fruit of that fulfillment. We are the fruit of the fulfillment. The gospel is extending to the ends of the earth, and so God's glory is extending to the ends of the earth. He says that that same gospel, which indeed is bearing fruit in the whole world increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, it continues to grow in two ways. It bears fruit and it increases. Bears fruit and spiritual maturity in the lives of those who are gospel people, and it increases, meaning more people are getting saved and the gospel is spreading to more areas. Both need to be happening. And when you have the gospel and it's on the forefront, both are happening. Here's the goal for this year. By God's grace, through the gospel, may I produce spiritual fruit that is commensurate with my gospel belief. Right? That would be a good goal for us. That would be us in the right categories. Gospel fruit coming from gospel belief, a harvest of a crop of good deeds that are rooted in a growth in spiritual maturity and the fruit of the Spirit. That is a part of the growth. But it's not just that. It's also gospel expansion. More souls and more people hearing and understanding the grace of God in truth. This is what the gospel is meant to do. It's meant to spread. As we think about 2023, we think about here's some changes that are happening. We're getting prayer into small groups. For second Sunday, it's going to prayers, corporate prayer time in our small groups, and then we're going to gather together quarterly for prayer. When it comes to baptisms, we're offering baptisms once a month because we want the mentality to be people are getting saved, so people need to keep getting baptized, right? Because the gospel is increasing. And then this year, one of our passions has been, man, we've got to get the gospel to the nation. So we're planting churches in Folsom. We're going to get other interns, Lord willing, to plant churches in other places around here, but we're not stopping here. The gospel's got to get to the ends of the earth. And by God's grace, he plopped a 17-year international church planting veteran into our church who we're going to pick up on our staff and you're going to get to meet in the days to come who's going to help us be an international church planning partner in our church that helps connect us with churches around the world that we might see more fruitful gospel churches being planted. That's going to be awesome. We, man, th- there, are, th- you, there are so many exciting things that I'm, I'm fired up about inside of our church, even as he speaks of like, the way he says this, as it, verse six, also does among you, since the day you guys heard it and understood the grace of God and truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our fellow beloved servant, this this learning language is discipleship language. This is us going, man, we are going to get the gospel from an idea into us experientially, and we're going to have so many outlets for that this year. We want us to know the gospel here. We want us to learn the gospel here. You want to walk in the gospel truth as a body of believers. In a church that's commended to you. One of the things Paul does here in verses 7 and 8 is he basically says the church you're going to is a legit church. I commend you to Epaphras, who's a faithful fellow minister. Wouldn't that be nice if Jesus came around and was like, some of your question, like, hey, what church should I go to? And he goes, yeah, that one, pastor by, yeah, that's a good church. There's websites for that, right? You find a website of a guy's theology that you like, and a bunch of people sign up, and you get a whole church directory of people that you can feel confident. They have good theology. If you've never visited one of those sites Maybe I'm the one that just gives those out on a regular basis to people who don't know that they exist. They do. The question of whether or not you know you have a right church is, 
that Paul would commend is, is the church preaching Paul's gospel? And is the church applying Paul's applications to the gospel in their own context? That would be the first thing. Figure out a church to go to. I dare you to go to that church for the whole year. I dare you to not leave the local church that you're going to figure out where to go to, even if it's not here. If it's here, praise God. Most of you are here already. But if it's not here, I dare you, double dog, to find a church that you don't leave for an entire year. I know that's so hard because we love like every six months. I get a little worked up. That church is just getting stale. I double dog dare you to find a church that you can stay at for one whole year. That would be awesome. Find one that teaches the gospel like Paul does. And then this, is your church's love the kind of love that the spirit alone can produce? Find that church. Find a church that has a supernatural love. Then invest in that church. Flesh out the gospel in that church. And may the gospel growth not just happen in us in maturity, but through our ministries and multiplication, increasing in number and expanding an area to the glory of God. This is what I would want, by the grace of God, to be true of Doxa in 2023. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. That was, uh, there was a lot there, and uh, eager to just get after it, Lord, eager to continue to see more fruit and faithfulness, God. Pray that you would um, help these truths be seeped into our own hearts, God. Give us a greater hunger for prayer. Give us a greater delight in you. Give, give us a greater desire to see the gospel spread beyond the walls of our church, Lord, not just in our own community, but around the world. Father, we're excited to see you, the work that you're gonna do. Would you do it in and through us to your glory and our good? And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.